Hello, welcome to the Swan Gamer. I'm your host, Rob, and in this video, we're going to be talking about the faction focus for the Sylvaneth. Now, this video may take a little while, so do plant your roots uh, and get ready to turn over a new leaf. Oh, there we go. Uh, about the new rules for the Sylvaneth faction uh, that are going to be playable in Age of Sigmar 4. I'm joined by the Twitch chat, uh, who do not like any of those jokes, uh, and so I apologise, but there are a bunch of saps. Right, the first thing we're going to look at are the battle traits, and there are some changes from Age of Sigmar 3, but if you are new, I'm just going to immediately focus on what they do in Age of Sigmar 4. The first thing to talk about with Sylvaneth, more than any other faction, is they predominantly work around... Well, some factions also work quite heavily around their terrain features, but specifically, they work around their terrain features, which are called Sylvaneth Wildwoods. Sylvaneth Wildwoods is a, a terrain pack that you buy from Games Workshop, and they come in three individual parts, one to three. And Sylvaneth Wildwoods, when you deploy them on the tabletop, can be one to three pieces in size. We haven't actually seen their war scroll yet, but that is what it says on their product description. So when you you summon a Sylvaneth Wildwood, which we'll get to in a moment, um, that Sylvaneth Wildwood can be one piece or it can be up to three pieces. One of the interesting things about this army is that then everything that happens with the army is almost always orientated around the Wildwoods. Now, I'm going to say before we jump out with any of this, is that Games Workshop have showed a bunch of missions, or the missions they're going to be using in the General's Handbook, and also terrain packs. And those terrain packs are fairly restrictive in that it says that terrain needs to be six inches apart from each other. In that case, it's going to be really difficult to place some Sylvaneth Wildwoods down. So I think one of the things that we're going to need to do as a community is really work out if Sylvaneth players are going to get the option to put terrain down and maybe make terrain need to be six and a half inches apart or something like that. You know, And you are going to have to, as a Sylvaneth player, plan out your missions a little bit easier. However, back in the day, and I'm sorry I'm going on about this a lot, back in the day, before Games Workshop did official terrain maps, I've obviously done some from The Honest Wargamer for a couple of years now, which lots of people in the world have used. Before they've done official terrain packs, going to an event would be a little bit of a, you know, a coin toss. You wouldn't know if you would be able to put your trees down and not put your trees down. So that consistency for Age of Sigma 4 coming out of Games Workshop, in my opinion, is going to benefit the Sylvaneth players because they can at least, even if if they know they're not going to be able to get a lot of Sylvaneth Wildwoods down, they at least know that before they start playing the game, which is genuinely really positive. All right, let's look at the battle traits which the armies apply to the Sylvaneth army, uh, the rules that apply to the Sylvaneth army, sorry. Uh, the first one is Endless Growth. Pick a number of friendly Sylvaneth units holding within six inches of a friendly Awakened Wildwood to be the targets, and then those heal D3 to each target. That's quite nice because it's the end of any turn, which means it's the end of every turn. There's a lot of healing in my personal opinion, okay? Next one is Strike and Fade. This is done once per turn at the end of any turn, right? Once per turn for the whole army, so only one unit in the army can do it, at the end of any turn, which does mean the end of every turn, which is really big stonks. Pick a friendly Sylvaneth unit that's in combat and is wholly within six inches, uh, that is in combat and is wholly within six inches of a friendly Awakened Wildwood to use this ability. Remove that unit from the battlefield and set it up again on the battlefield more than nine inches from all enemy units and wholly within six inches of a different friendly Awakened Wildwood. Now, this is different to how it previously worked in Age of Sigmar 3, where what you would do is you charge in, fight, and immediately teleport away. The problem is, is that that was such an incredibly powerful ability. I felt like you needed, uh, the points on units needed to be just that bit higher because of their ability to hit something and then just vanish without any retaliation. And yes, Age of Sigma 4 and 3 featured a lot of strike first, strike last, and a bunch of other mechanics, so it was difficult to engage with your opponent, but you still could, in most cases, engage. This, being both turns, gives you a lot of option for teleporting around, and in conjunction with the new command traits, uh, sorry, new command abilities like uh, counter charge, power through, or even redeploy, I think it's going to give you more movement options. It's not just going to give you a one note, teleport in, do a big fight, teleport away. I think this is going to give you more options and more teleports, and I think that's genuinely a better game state for you as a Sylvaneth player. But right now, I think Sylvaneth players are going to be like, no, Rob, actually, it's terrible. Super fair, I understand your feelings, but I think it's better for the health of the game. It's also better for the health of your army, my personal opinion. But We'll see whether or not that pans out. I can be wrong. Uh, next up, though, it, and because of all those already additional movement things like counter charges, like power through, you've now got um, uh, 
sorry, in addition to the striking fade, you've also, in addition, got walk the hidden pass, which is done once per turn for your army in your movement phase. You pick a friendly Sylvaneth unit that's not in combat and is wholly within six inches of friendly Awaken Wildwood to use this ability. Move that unit from the battlefield and set it up again on the battlefield more than nine inches from all enemy units, wholly within six inches of a different Awaken Wildwood. It's pretty decent, right? Because... You're now teleporting in your turn as well. You're potentially teleporting at the end of the turn. Like, that feels like a lot of movement that you can do in conjunction with all of the other abilities that you can do in the game. I think to note is it's got the core keyword at the bottom, and what this does mean is you won't be able to move after, because that's how that works. Also, any unit that's been set up that turn also can't move, right? Uh, okay, so battle formation. So I would say it's a pretty nice suite of abilities. You're healing a lot and uh, you're teleporting a lot. Is this effective as, you know, Nurgle and potentially spreading disease and shutting down healing? N not sure. Like, we'll have to see. Uh, next up, battle formations. There are four battle formations at the start of Age of Sigmar 4 for the different armies. This one is the Lords of the Clan and focuses on the monsters that you can get. Uh, and the ability that you get, the Healing Song, is when using the Endless Growth ability, the thing that does D3 heal at the end of each turn, Friendly Silvereth monsters can heal three instead of D3, which is quite nice. Because it does mean in one battle round, a single monster is healing six, which is pretty fucking nutty in my personal opinion. Uh, so I quite like that. Uh, then you've got Arcana and Incantations. So in your army, you're going to have the ability to have a spell, uh, like pick a spell law and you write it on your army list. Please go see my how to write uh, an Age of Sigma 4 army list video. Uh, and then you will have access to probably three spells for each army, maybe sometimes more for more armies. And uh, each one of the wizards in your army can cast any spell from that spell law. If it's got an unlimited keyword, which you can see at the bottom just there, then that does mean that that keyword, then every wizard in your army can cast that spell, that hero phase. So you can cast it multiple times. The same wizard can't cast it more than once, but m multiple wizards can cast it. Hope that makes sense. You need a um, uh, you need a six to cast this. So that means you could get a result of like a four and a two, or a five and a one, or even trees and trees. Uh, and that'll make a total of six to cast the spell. Uh, you pick a friendly silver wizard to cast it, and if there are fewer than three friendly awakened wildwoods on the battlefield, you can set up an awakened wildwood wholly within 18 inches of the caster, and more than three inches from all enemy units, objectives, and other terrain features. And that's where it's maybe going to be a little bit difficult to place your terrain feature. But we'll see. We'll have to see. We'll have to get the maps out, get the board out. You assume the play at the Games Workshop have done this themselves, and so they think that there's a the potential to place the Wildwoods down. So more than three inches from all those units, uh, from all those things, sorry. Um, if they're already three... Friendly Awakened Wildwoods on the battlefield, you can heal three to each Friendly Awakened Wildwood. In Age of Sigma 4, terrain, faction terrain specifically, has got a health value. That health value means that it can be attacked, shot, and murdered, basically. What this will mean is that they are going to burn down your trees, which is obviously going to make you furious. But you can also put more Awakened Wildwoods on the board. Amazingly, you're going to be able to cast this spell on your opponent's turn with the command ability to cast spells in your opponent's turn, which is quite interesting especially for doing strike and fade in your opponent's turn. So just think of that possibility. Do a strike and fade in your opponent's turn. You could potentially cast this spell on your opponent's turn, counter charge in your opponent's turn, then you strike and fade at the end of your opponent's turn and be somewhere else. There's a lot of mobility, and this feels like it's got a very high skill ceiling already, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, you'll probably start the game with no uh, Wildwoods on the board, and you'll immediately be able to uh, put three on the board if you have three wizards. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of Wildwoods immediately, right? Okay. Now we're going to show off units, and the first one we're going to look at is Alariel, so the goddess herself. And it does really feel like it's the centerpiece edition, and it feels like Alariel is definitely kind of playing that role of being something you're probably going to want to take. 16 health on a 3-up save, control value 5, which is what most monsters have been. However, it moves 14 inches, okay? Alar well, it, sorry, she, uh, moves 14 inches. And that's really, really nice because that gives you a really big potential threat range initially, considering she is a kind of caster resurrection combat piece. She is a complete hybrid unit, so I expect to be quite expensive. Um, in combat, absolute slaps with Spirit Coronoth with five attacks that do damage two, but the Wardroth Great Antlers, six attacks that do damage four. It's a companion ability, so you're not going to be able to uh, improve its stat line, but importantly, uh, hitting on a four is pretty weak, but don't forget, 
is the average. So you potentially 24 damage. And in some situations, you'll do zero, and in some situations, you'll do a lot of damage. Rent 2 is also quite nice as well. Um, so I would say it's a pretty good like combat unit in my in my estimation because of the threat. Your opponent your opponent can't guarantee that you're not going to roll like five hits. And so your opponent's going to be really cautious of this really fast, absolute juggernaut of damage, in my opinion. Is a level three caster, has a six up ward save for survivability, but has got all of that healing. There's more as well. Three casts is great, in my personal opinion. Um, and then obviously as a war master, so it's four units in its regiment. Now, it's got a, a battle damage status, so you get slightly less attacks if it's taken 10 health. And in any hero phase, which means every hero phase, you can be able to do life bloom, where you pick one of the following effects, add one to the casting roll to this unit for the rest of the turn. That's really nice. Really nice if you're going to be like, right, I'm going to cast three spells this turn, all at plus one. Love that. If you happen to be near a source of power, which is a terrain feature in Age of Sigma 4, that's plus two to cast. That feels pretty spicy, in my opinion. Uh, or heal 2d3. If you're already healing at the end of any turn, that's now 3d3 that you've healed. That's potentially up to nine health back on a 16 health model. That feels... Very nice, in my personal opinion. Uh, so it's a lot of healing, so should survive. If it doesn't survive, if Alariel does not survive, in your movement phase, you have the Right of Life ability, where you pick a friendly Sylvaneth unit that's been destroyed to be the target. And amazingly, like, this is hype as fuck. This unit can use this ability if it's been destroyed, but if it does, this unit must be the target. So even if you kill Alariel, she can still use an ability and target herself. And what you do is you roll a dice, and on a four-up, you set up a replacement unit with half the number of models from the target unit rounding up wholly within nine inches of friendly awakened wildwood and more than nine inches from all enemy units. So that's good. I'm taking six Colonel Hunters or I'm taking six Spike Rider Lancers. I can always bring three back. I love that. In addition, though, if the target was a monster like a Lariel or Durthu, Allocate eight damage points to the replacement unit. Ward rolls kind of made for those damage points. Now, here's where it gets really spicy, in my opinion. Uh, eight, eight damage points to the replacement, and then it can start healing. So, you bring back Alariel at only eight health left, and at the end of the turn, you can heal D3, and then in any hero phase, you can heal 2D3. So, it's very possible that Alariel gets wiped off the board, and then in your next turn, comes back to life, and then at the end of the next hero phase, is just back to full health, which is amazing. So, pretty impressive in my opinion. Okay, uh, so next up, uh, yeah, and you can bring units back. And like that, like I've said, like with the great and clean one, this feels like it's a centerpiece model that you need because your resurrection is based on a model. Your resurrection is not uh, built into your key battle traits. So if you want to have a resurrecting army, you're going to need to bring a Lariel on the board. Uh, lastly, she, well, second to last, she has a living battering ram rampage, which is done in any charge phase, end of every charge phase. If this unit charges turn, pick an infantry unit and you do D3 mortal damage. It's not that impressive. But what is impressive is a spell, which is cast on seven, pick a visible enemy unit within 12 inches of this unit. You inflict D3 mortal damage, which is quite a high spell cast uh, output damage wise. That's a lot of damage from a spell cast. 2D3 mortal damage. Uh, and then if the target is destroyed by this spell, you can immediately resolve the effect. Uh, uh, roll a dice on three. Oh, wow, yes. All right, chat. Sorry, I apologize. Everyone in the chat is just pointing out that the living battering ram ability for the rampage is up to six mortal damage. So it's not roll a D3. So roll a dice on a three plus. Wow, so you can up to do six damage. This So this means that when they went through all of the rules and they decided they were going to change it to the D3 thing, uh, they never got round to this and copy and pasted it over. <laughs> so, whatever it was. But you can do six mortal damage, which is very nice. Anyway, going back to her spell, pick an enemy target within 12 inches, cast on seven, do 2d3 mortal damage, which is quite a lot. And if the target is destroyed by the spell, you can immediately resolve the effect of Tree Song spell, so you can set up a Sylvaneth Wildwood. Don't forget, again, this is, again, a spell you can do in your opponent's turn. So, that's pretty fun. Kill a unit, maybe put a Sylvaneth Wildwood up, block an enemy shooting unit from being able to shoot. I love that idea. There's some real good options that you can do here. And already there's a lot of plays and counterplays, which is going to make the board state very dynamic. 
Next up, so I think Alariel feels like an auto buy. We haven't yet seen some of the other key pieces. So, like in Alariel's example, you probably have two other, three other faction leaders now. You've got Belthanos, um, where Belthanos probably doesn't have the resurrection ability, but probably adds a lot to the combat of the army. So, what they might be doing is be like, cool, you want to build your army around Alariel, you're going to be a bit of a resurrection army. If you're going to build your army around Belthanos, you're going to be more of like a heavy combat army. Then obviously you have uh, the the caster unit. Uh, I forget its name right now, but like that unit probably is going to be the, a leader for a more uh, you know magic casty uh, warsong revenant, yeah, um, a more casty heavy army. And then obviously you've got Dreicher, and Dreicher might also add more teleports or something like that. And so the real question is whether or not the game is going to look like that at the moment. We don't know. We haven't seen two different you know quote unquote centerpiece models right now so we've got to wait to see what happens okay next up spirit of durthu uh 14 health with three up saves it's a big combat monster no ward save has got a guardian sword which is the main thing that we're going to look at which is four attacks hits on a three wounds on a two rend two damage five it's got anti monster rend one for rend three uh you can also get plus one to hit uh, if you are within three inches of Awakened Wildwood, thanks to the passive Wrathful Guardian, and uh, has got a Rampage where called Titanic Jewel, which is done once per turn uh, in any combat phase, every combat phase. So if you've got multiple Durthus, you can only do it one time. Pick an enemy monster in combat with this unit to be the target. Roll dice on a three plus, subtract one from the attack characteristic of that target's melee weapons for the rest of the turn, which is a pretty bad Rampage. Minus one to hit is fine. I mean, it's good against Gargans, right? Like, genuinely like they're now hitting on fives so that's pretty good uh in the right situation it's going to be good but some of the rampages have been amazing and so we'll have to see oh yeah thank you to rebecca in the chat for reminding me also the lady of vines is also like a character that you may do you know an additional like uh centerpiece model that you build an army around there's there's loads of scope i don't want to get everyone hopes up but there's loads of scope for them to have designed a game where it's kind of you're playing silverneth oh it's like an alariel silverneth list you're playing silverneth oh you're playing uh lady of vine silverneth list and they're different because those key centerpiece models are, have those abilities locked right uh spirit of dirthu is always just going to be a combat monster that's what he does uh four attacks feels fine damage five feels good um You'll have to see. I mean, that works against a lot of stuff. Ren 2. Let me know what you think about Durthu. I think I would have liked to have seen him be a little bit scarier, in my personal opinion, but we'll see. Uh, then we've got Spike Revenants. This is a unit of five. They have got two health, a five up save. They move five inches, a control value of one. So they're not going to be great for controlling an objective. But they have got three attacks each, which is going to be 15 attacks from the unit. Thanks to having a champion, it's going to be 16 attacks. So if you did have a unit of 10, you're going to have... Uh, you're going to have 31 attacks, which hit on threes, but they have crit mortals. So any sixes to hit are going to do a mortal damage. So that's five mortal damage, which is quite good. Uh, but then they wound on a four, which is bad, and they have no rend, which is worse, and they're at damage one. They also have, in any combat phase, the ability to pick an infantry unit and roll a dice on a three plus. That unit cannot use commands for the rest of the turn. And that's, like, okay, depending on what they decide they're going to do. Um, Spike Revenants have lost their ability to teleport around the board, although that's kind of locked in. Uh, they have two health each, which is quite nice. As a unit of five is going to be 10 health, but only a five up save means they're going to get whittled down pretty quickly. And I think um, we'll have to see. A unit of 10 uh, will it could be quite interesting. Unit of 10 could be quite interesting. Uh, and then finally, the Spike Rider Lancers. This is a unit of three. They've got five health each. That's 15 health. Um, they have a four up save. Yeah, a good point to make is that I said the spite revenants lost the teleport. That's the tree revenants that have the teleport, not the spite revenants. Before anyone on the YouTube shouts at me, okay, I apologize. Um, spite Red, spite Red lances are three wounds each. Uh, sorry, three models each with five health each for fifteen health on a four up save. Okay, each model has basically got six attacks with speed being split across two different profiles with three attacks each. The first one, the Spike Rider Lance, hits on a three. It's three attacks, hits on a three, wounds on a four, rend one, unless you hit in cavalry, in which case it's rend two, and then damage one, unless you're charged, in which case it's damage two. The Sharp Mandibles is also three attacks, hitting on fours, wounds on threes, uh, rend one, and then plus one damage. So it's going to be damage two. So potentially six damage two attacks 
from a unit from a single model with 18 damage to attacks across the unit of three and 36 damage to attacks across the unit of six, which just feels like a lot of damage, especially on a unit that moves really fast, moves 12 inches. It's pretty good. Uh, this unit has got a coherency range of two inches because they've just got massive wings. Uh, they heal three at the end of any turn, which means the which means the end of every turn. So that means you can heal a lot on this unit, which feels really nice. And then they've got Descent of the Spike Riders. If this unit charges this turn, roll a dice on a three plus, this unit has strike first for the rest of the turn. And that is huge because now you can counter charge in your opponent's turn Obviously, in your turn when you charge, you're always going to get the choice to pick this unit to go first anyway. Now, if your opponent has strike last and you have strike first, that means you get to strike at your normal initiative or like, you know, where you can fight normally in the steps. So in my turn, if I charged in and then I get strike first off, but then they make me strike last, I still get to choose to fight with this unit before they get to hit because it's my turn. In my opponent's turn, if I counter charge and then I strike first, then I'm going to get to strike before them. If I strike first and they make me strike last, they're going to get to hit before me. Uh, so this is really good, especially if you're charging any units that don't have strike last in your opponent's turn, because that's going to be wild, the amount of damage. And then counter charge into your opponent's turn, whack something to death, and then at the end of that turn, you can strike and fade. Very mobile. This game, this is going to be an amazingly fun army to play. And that's it. Now, obviously, there's loads of stuff missing. Uh, and as I've said, this is probably one of the faction focuses that made me most excited because what we've actually got to see here is that kind of uh, leader ability and the fact that we might get to see loads of leader abilities really identify an army. It's going to actually feel like a leader is leading. And I, I'm really excited. I can't wait to get the faction rules. Silver Death, I'm off to go get a Silver Death army. That's all I'm going to say. Like, I've needed, I've needed the motivation. Here it is. These look great. There are so many options here as a player on the tabletop. Obviously, all of this is points dependent, but I'm going to be able to teleport in multiple turns. I'm going to be able to counter charge power through in multiple turns. I've got healing resurrection that people don't know how that they can use. The big question is, is am I going to be able to put enough Silver Wildwoods Wild Woods down? We'll have to see. You have to get out those terrain maps and measure them. They've already put some on Warhammer Community, so you can do it yourself at home. You can basically work out where you would put some Wild Woods and if you think that'll work for how you plan on playing. But they've got fast units, lots of healing, hitting power, good magicians. I think it could be one of the best armies. We'll see. Thanks for watching my video. I hope to see you soon.